Okay, hello and welcome to uh, Identity in Peer Review webinar hosted by the British Blockchain Association. This webinar is a part of uh, Peer Review Week uh, that we are celebrating uh, this year. My name is Dr. Naseem Nakwi. I am the Editor-in-Chief of the Journal of the British Blockchain Association. The plan is that uh, I'm going to give a talk on what peer review is, uh, some uh, background to how it all started, the fundamentals of scientific method, and then we um, discuss the when, where, what, how, and why of peer review. And these are important questions. So, to begin with a bit of history of science and scientific method, and then uh, what peer review means uh, for you as a blockchain uh, researcher, and also if you are a reviewer, uh, what are some of the most important considerations? So in order to have a clear understanding of the fundamentals of peer review process. I think what's important is that we need to have a basic grasp of how scientific method uh, works. So, so what is science? So science is essentially a process of discovering uh, universal truths. It's a process of establishing facts through systematic uh, and in structured practical activity of the study of the world that is around us through observation and experiment. So science essentially builds uh, and organizes knowledge in the form of our testable explanations and then make some predictions about how things work. So how do we do that? This process of, of practicing science is called scientific method. And the way it works is that you make an observation so let's say you are interested in um, supply chains and you observed that the tracking of goods in traditional supply chains is slow and it's inefficient. So you have made this observation. Now the next is you ask a question. And the question could be, could take different shapes or forms but what's important is that you have to be very precise in your question. So let's say my question is, can blockchains help to reduce the time it takes from uh, goods to be um, transferred from one end of the supply chain to another? So you are interested in this, in this variant called time. It can be anything. It could be uh, consumer satisfaction, and, and a low host of other things. So let's say you stick to the time. Now, the next thing is you do is you put forward a hypothesis, which is a testable explanation. So blockchains could reduce the time uh, required to track a product or a goods from one pole of the supply chain to another. So your, your testable hypothesis is that now you're going to do something about it. And it is very important also to specify which blockchain you are going to use in what circumstances. You have to be very clear uh, in, your, in, your, uh, in your testable hypothesis. What the, the question has to be extremely clear. So you can't just say like, uh, I'm going to do an experiment to see how blockchains could uh, revolutionize supply chain or, or transform supply chain. That's, that those words means nothing to me as a scientist. Uh, revolutionize in what way, transform in what way. So I have to be very specific, as specific as I can. So the one way you could do this is by following this approach called problem comparison, intervention, and outcome. So what is the problem? Um, what is the uh, comparison? So who are the um, who are you comparing it with? So the current system you have your legacy system or whatever the traditional method of supply chain is. And then uh, what is your intervention? So let's say you come up with whatever blockchain and, and you put forward this hypothesis that if we uh, do this, 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 
but rather than doing on a traditional system, we do this on a blockchain, we can see efficiencies uh, in how we, how we uh, manage these chains. And then O is your outcome. So what are the exact outcomes that you are interested in? So problem, compare it with the existing infrastructure. I is the intervention, so your, your experiment. And then O is the outcome, what outcome you are interested in. Because remember that when you take your results to policymakers or regulators or to enterprises, they would like to ask these questions. So they will be very specific about you. So, um, so, the next, so the next question is that you do this test and then you make some predictions about what might happen. So you, so you might say that uh, I'm expecting uh, this supply chain to become more efficient uh, a, by, by 50% or whatever. So you make some prediction uh, and then you go ahead and do your test. Now you've got some results. Now, if your results agree with your hypothesis, the, the, the initial hypothesis, then you have supporting evidence. And you could take this fo forward, you can write a white paper, you can launch your product, you have some evidence that uh, whatever you are doing is, is working and there are some um, concrete results. Now, if they do not agree with your experiment, your results do not agree with your initial hypothesis, then you have to discard it and start again. Because as Richard Feynman once said, it doesn't matter how beautiful your theory is, if it does not agree with experiment, then it's wrong. So once you have the results, you should then publish your findings, ideally in a, in a peer reviewed journal or at a scientific conference, and then wait and see if the, the scientific community and your peers uh, verify it or falsify it. They might say, we have got a better blockchain, we have got a better platform, we have a better data, we have a different data from different source. So this goes on. So I get some results and you don't believe in my result. And you went on and initially tried to show that what I was doing, I was not making any sense, but now you conducted the same experiment under the same conditions. And you got a result that now actually agrees with my result. And then someone from another country did a similar study and they also kind of got similar results. So now what, what we have is this um, emergent objective truth an emergent consensus, which is not on, based on any opinions, but of observation and testable scientific experiment. And those results are going to be true whether any blockchain cynic or skeptic believe in it or not. Because what we have is an experimentally determined result. This is what we call best available scientific evidence at any given time. So I hope that is clear what scientific method uh, means. Now, humans have always been very curious about how things work and how things happen and if there is a plausible explanation of why they happen. And Perhaps the first person to conduct these scientific experiments was Hippocrates, this guy here. Um, and for example, diabetes, he was a physician. He was many things, but diabetes, which we now know is a disease caused by the deficiency of insulin in the body. It was considered to be a kind of a mysterious evil illness that people uh, thought that um, would just be a death, a death sentence. And if you get it, you become unwell and then you die. And they thought it was a, a mysterious evil disease. But he made an, an interesting observation. What he observed is that the ants and insects were quite immediately attracted to the um, urine of these patients. And he was very curious. So he put up a testable uh, hypothesis. And, it, and he thought that, is this because the urine of these patients was somehow sweeter than the, than the other normal people? Uh, so since there were no labs and he was an incredibly crazy physician, what he did is he tasted the urine of these patients himself. And he was right. It was way sweeter than normal people. So he concluded that this disease is not caused by any evil spirit, but it is actually caused by uh, your body losing sugar uh, and running through this urine uh, in, the, in the form of uh, sugar. So hence the Greek name dia BTs. Dia means run, BTs means through, so it means to run through. So your sugar is running through the urine. So this was the first ever definition of diabetes based on 
uh, scientific experiment. So around the same time uh, lived this guy uh, called Socrates and he would ask questions. He would ask lots of questions and mostly starting with, with why and uh, the famous uh, Socratic deduction method, which is still used by, by uh, philosophers to this date. And it essentially it encourages people to ask questions. So he was asking uh, young people in, in Greece to stay very curious and he would ask lots of questions and even question the authority. And this was perhaps the reason that uh, the king at that time was so upset that he was uh, sentenced to death for uh, corrupting the youth of Athens because he would not accept the, uh, the laws and the sayings from the, from the authority. He said, we need to question everything. Then came this guy called Aristotle and he said that we must critically evaluate all pieces of information before accepting it as truth. And, um, but perhaps I think the, the, the most uh, significant uh, uh, development was this person uh, called Ibn al-Haysam or al-Hazan in European text. And he said that the duty of scientists is not to only question uh, and, and critically examine the writing of other scientists, but also be very self-critical of your own work uh, so that you avoid falling into this trap of bias and prejudice because we all love our work. We, it is very hard for us to criti critically evaluate our own work. So he, he said that we, will go, we should actually go one step further, not only critically evaluate other, other people's work, but our own work as well. Before people point out the flaws in our own study, we should look at it uh, uh, with, a, with a very critical eye. Then came this uh, enlightenment period uh, where in the 16th and 17th century with the era of Einstein, Francis Bacon, Galileo and others, and they were the proponents of peer review and open science. Before those folks, you could just thought stuff up and people believe it to be true. And this was the period when researchers began to appreciate the idea that uh, humans together could know more and the collective intelligence and wisdom in the search for truth was something that was uh, established. It was around that time, what you see on the right-hand side of your, of your screen is uh, the Royal Society published the first, perhaps the first peer-reviewed journal called Philosophical Transactions. And what was considered to be um, the first of its kind and the editor would independently examine the contents of the submitted research and make some decisions. So he would sometimes invite reviewers or experts in the field to comment or, or look at the work. And this sparked a series of scientific developments which spread across the globe with the launch of scientific societies, research centers and journals. Today, there are around 30,000 scientific journals in the world. This is an approximate uh, estimate with close to 2 million research articles published uh, each year. This is some history of how things progressed in science. So what is uh, peer review? Now peer review activity is actually taking place uh, in our society and communities all the time. In democracy, we use peer review to uh, do things like voting systems. So when we vote, that's a form of peer review. Uh, if we have a jury panel in a court, that's a form of peer review when you book your holidays and hotels, you check out reviews from your peers uh, to make decisions. When you buy something on Amazon, you first thing you look at are the reviews from your peers. So in science peer review is this idea that your peers evaluate and comment on your work and provide some constructive criticism. And these peers are carefully uh, selected by the journal's editorial board. And these are hopefully experts who can um, comment on your work and, and qualify to do so. And this essentially allows us to crowdsource knowledge. It gives the authors an opportunity to see their blind spots and identify any errors and areas of improvement so they can make their work better. So the whole idea of what I see a peer review is to make 
uh, the work better by providing constructive feedback. So uh, the blind spots are identified and then authors can work on them and uh, improve on the quality of their manuscript. So a rigorous peer review should ensure that uh, if the authors claim that their work is novel, that it really is. It should also ensure that there are no over-exaggerated uh, claims made in the paper, which authors sometimes do. Um, it should also ensure that there are no inaccurate conclusions. Uh, they should match uh, your methodology and your original uh, initial hypothesis. So you can't start working on something and then all of a sudden in the conclusion, you come up with a completely different conclusion. Uh, so it has to it has to match and concur with the work that you, you have done. It should also ensure that the paper is relatively free from bias and the authors have declared any conflict of interest, et cetera. So overall, the peer review is a quality control uh, filter that provides a higher degree of scrutiny. So for, for authors, it helps to improve the quality of their manuscript which obviously in turn would be beneficial to them, uh, to the society, to policymakers, to science in general. And if more, more people are looking at an experiment, it, it would give us better knowledge. So peer review is essentially a check and balance mechanism on um, bad knowledge going forward. So there is a medium of accountability. Peer review is the true democracy in science. That's what I believe. So how it works, uh, I can give you uh, the example of the JBBA. So when you submit your paper to the JBBA, it is received by the handling editor who looks at the paper and determine whether it is suitable for the journal or not. And when I say the initial suitability means that it, it is actually related to the field, the blockchain distributed ledgers or cryptocurrencies, so we once received a manuscript on some uh, radio transistor waves uh, in Arctic expeditions, something like that. And there was no single mention of blockchain or distributed ledgers or crypto anywhere. So it was clearly submitted to a wrong journal and we desk rejected it. If the paper is deemed suitable for the journal, then the managing editor invites two to three reviewers based on their expertise and suitability. Sometimes the managing editor discuss with myself uh, to look at the paper and um, identify reviewers who would be most suitable for that manuscript. Once the paper is reviewed, uh, we have three possible outcomes, accept, reject, or revision. Now, very rarely there are three clear accepts or three clear rejects. It is usually a mix of some rejections, some revisions, uh, something like that. So the whole idea is to improve the quality of the manuscript. So unless it's uh, completely unacceptable which, and it has major, major flaws, then we would reject the paper, but if the uh, paper looks reasonable and it looks like there is some substance to it, uh, then we send the paper back to the authors for revision. And sometimes they need to sub substantiate some claims that they have made in the paper. Uh, maybe they have not backed up uh, their claims by citing the correct references. Maybe they have not cited any references at all. So this is a big mistake. I think if you are, if you are making some claims, then you have to, you must uh, uh, cite references of why you are saying that. Where did you get that piece of information? And that's what differentiates a, a blog post or a white paper from a proper research paper. In a, in a research paper, you can't just make uh, claims or, 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 or certain suggestions and just move forward you have to back it up. So the revision work for you as an author, it varies, it could be minimal, it could be moderate, it could be uh, quite extensive, depending upon the deficiencies that the reviewers have identified in your 
uh, original work. So this is kind of in a nutshell how peer review works. And I've included this slide just to give you an idea of uh, how peer review and uh, scientific research is important from a funding perspective. So this is a UK's research and excellence framework. So for universities and public institutions, peer reviewed research is very important uh, from a funding perspective, from university ranking perspective, and there are many other um, uh, determinants. So universities and research institutions around the globe are funded based on the quality and the quantity of their research outputs. So if you are a university uh, and you say that you are uh, conducting blockchain research and you want your government to fund you, then you have to come up with some evidence what you are doing in this space. So, uh, and these are called outputs. So what are the outputs? How many papers have you published? How many case studies have you published? What has been the impact? And there are, there are many other variables, but the, one of the most important ones uh, is, is evidence of peer reviewed research. And in some countries, your grant application may be declined if you cite a non peer reviewed work. So for universities in the UK, 60% of funding allocation to institutions um, from UK research excellence framework is awarded based on your evidence of peer reviewed uh, publication outputs. In Poland, for example, researchers will not receive funding from the National Science Agency, which is the national uh, body for research in Poland, if they do not publish uh, peer reviewed articles that are uh, in the journals that are indexed in directory of open access journals. So uh, your research has to be open access. So JBBA is an open access journal um, and, and you must have um, uh, your research uh, peer reviewed. So what are the limitations of peer review, uh, this process? So while peer review, I would say, does provide some authority of approval that the work is recognized as robust and free of bias by experts in the field, it does not guarantee that something that is published cannot be found to be wrong in the future. It only demonstrates that the published work is relatively correct and free from any major errors or omissions at the time of review. Scientific work published in peer reviewed journals has been found to be wrong down the road. But what's important to understand that peer review is a very structured professional activity. And most journals such as the JBBA aim for a double blind peer review. And what it means is that it's, a, it's an anonymous process at both ends. So the reviewers don't know the identity of the author and they purely assess the work based on merit. So we remove all identifiable information. For example, it doesn't matter which university uh, you have come from when you are submitting your work to the JBB. Uh, sometimes, uh, there is this halo effect that if I'm from a very prestigious university, my research will be excellent. No, not necessarily the case. You can come from a very small university and can publish a world-class paper. But uh, a bias can be introduced. If I know uh, your department or your university, uh, then the, my, my review may be biased. Maybe, not always, but it is a possibility. So, so the, the, the scientific gold standard is, is a double blind review. So you don't know the identity of the author and they don't know the identity of the review. So in reality, block, because blockchain is a relatively new discipline and people uh, tend to know each other uh, and their work, they can sometimes figure out who is who and biases do get introduced. But that said, the idea of peer review is really important one and the one that has been the bedrock of science for last many centuries. Now, sometimes people ask, what if the research is later on turned out to be wrong? So, as I said before, there are many things which we don't know about, but what we have is a 
a cross section at any topic at any given time an experimentally determined uh, result which has been double checked and triple checked by different researchers and that will not later shown to be wrong what we what we can find is a much deeper understanding of blockchain which encloses that understanding what newton described as standing on shoulders of giants so your new results become a subset uh, an accurately defined subset of a larger experiment. So for example, Lightning Network and decentralized autonomous organizations and NFTs and smart contracts, they are all ongoing experiments and refinements and extension of the original experiment that was conducted uh, by Satoshi when he first presented the idea of Bitcoin. And now things seems to be getting better and better as we uh, learn more and know more and experiment more. So thank you for listening. Uh, to learn more about blockchain uh, research, case studies, peer review process, uh, feel free to visit the JBBA website. I would recommend that you do so if you are a blockchain researcher. And we have published many peer reviewed case studies, uh, which you can find on the, the JBBA website. Now, if you have any questions, please feel free to type your questions in the chat box. And what I'm going to do is share with you uh, a short video from our associate editor in chief, Professor Mark Pilkington, who was unable to attend because he was traveling. And let me share the video. In the meantime, if you have any questions, please feel free to type in the chat box. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Mark Pilkington. I am associate professor at Epoca University in uh, Albania, newly appointed. Uh, Epoca is a leading higher education uh, institution in the Balkan region. And uh, today I would like to uh, share my thoughts with you on what it is to be uh, an excellent reviewer and to share uh, a few tips uh, with you, of course. So I apologize, I cannot be with you uh, live. I had planned a short uh, round trip to my home country, which is France. And uh, unfortunately, I um, had we had to record this uh, podcast. So I would like to thank, of course, the um, editorial board of the uh, Journal of British Blockchain Association, Dr. Nassim, Editor-in-Chief, uh, for giving me the uh, uh, wonderful opportunity to um, give uh, this little speech uh, today. So in fact, my uh, speech is very much intended for the uh, new reviewers who have been uh, recently invited by the journal to review some uh, submitted papers and to provide their uh, editorial assessment within the broader uh, philosophy or framework of peer review, blind peer review, which as you know is uh, uh, one of the cornerstones of uh, GBBA uh, research and uh, publication uh, strategy. So what is a review other than a scholarly task which consists of the evaluation uh, of a submitted article to a journal in order to facilitate the uh, editorial decision-making process, uh, whether to accept the paper, whether to reject it, or maybe to accept with some uh, major revisions or some uh, minor revisions. I would say that reviewing is one of the most uh, fundamental missions in scholarly uh, research because it gives uh, scholars the opportunity to respond anonymously to the research of their peers. A few words on excellence. I don't want to dwell too much on philosophy here, but I had a look, a quick look at the dictionary definition. Uh, excellent means the quality of being excellent, which is a bit of a circular definition here. And the adjective refers to some kind of virtue, you know, uh, academic excellence. 
I'm not going to try to give you my own definition of excellence. I will just try to uh, uh, draw a distinction between perfection and uh, excellence. I think perfection is some kind of uh, imaginary uh, state or some uh, ideal. However, I believe that uh, excellence is achievable in the real world. So this is what we are striving for uh, today. So, now that you are in the shoes of a GBBA a reviewer, what is expected from you? Of course, we're going to ask you to uh, analyze the work under uh, scrutiny, the article which has been submitted to the journal. So, you're going to draw on your own academic expertise, which, in a way, is already uh, a proof or evidence of excellence on your side. But we're not talking about your excellence, we're talking about the excellence of your review or your reviewing. And uh, this review is going to um, be conducted in order to uh, make a critical evaluation of the submitted article. And what is a critical evaluation? That means that you're going to question things such as the uh, validity, the rigor, the uh, originality, and possibly the quality of the academic uh, writing of the paper. Uh, another big question is, does it fill a void in the existing literature? I think this is very important to put the work in context. So this is why, and this speech is not about what it takes to write a good paper, this being the object of, you know, a blockchain paper, this being the object of uh, other uh, webinars uh, before, uh, but what it is to be a good reviewer, or what is it to perform an excellent uh, review. So I think uh, context, to contextualize the work that's been submitted to you is definitely something that is very important. A little disclaimer or thought about um, conflicts of interest. Uh, I think they should not go uh, unnoticed. Uh, have a look before you start, before you accept a review, have a look at the uh, sources of funding um, mentioned in the paper. Do inform uh, your chief uh, editor, so in the case of Heron Dr. Nassim, if you suspect a conflict of interest. So even though the review is anonymous, here we're dealing with some kind of ethical uh, issue and I think ethics is part of um, what we do. Remember, reviewing is not the same as uh, research or personal research. So that means refer from drawing on your own research in a way that is too explicit or too visible. Okay, uh, You're going to start your review with a brief synthesis of the submission of the article. Please keep this synthesis as short as possible and try to go beyond a mere uh, summary of the, uh, of the paper. Okay? Do remain professional at all times. Avoid personal considerations. There might be a scholar who is cited in the paper that you hate or you strongly dislike for whatever reason that is valid or not. Uh, this, of course, should not influence your review, should not shape your review. Um, by the way, it doesn't mean that you are not going to uh, express some personal views on the paper. You are going to express some personal views. You are not a machine, you're not a robot. But the main difference with what I said before is that these uh, personal views that you're going to express uh, to express, sorry, are going to be based on evidence. That this is why we are so keen on, you know, the Center for uh, Evidence-Based Blockchain, on GBBA, the British uh, Blockchain Association, on evidence-based um, blockchain research. Okay. Uh, so remember, your views do matter, but they uh, should be based on uh, evidence, and it's also about how the evidence is presented. Does it follow a logical path? Uh, that the reader of the, the journal, the, the article, will be able to follow and understand. Some useful questions that I think you need to ask yourself. Um, first, the connection between the work that has been submitted and the, submitted and the related works 
on the same topic. So that takes us back to the uh, review of literature that should be presented early and that is absolutely essential. What is the significance of the work? And when I'm talking about the significance, I might even mention the social significance. Is it a, not an article which is circumscribed to a rather obscure field that bears little relevance to the, um, to the uh, um, social arena, or is it something that is socially um, relevant and interesting? Also ask yourself about the, um, what is missing in a paper. Uh, what stands in the way of making it a uh, publishable uh, material? What are the features of a publishable paper that might actually be missing? Let us mention here uh, certain types of evidence, certain research methods, certain theoretical approaches, and maybe some type of uh, data as well. Uh, look at the conclusion. Do you agree with the conclusion of the paper? Not so much based on your personal views again, but in the light of two different things. The uh, evidence which has been presented to you and uh, coherence. Uh, has the author or the authors uh, been consistent between the introduction, the time when they announce what their research objective is, and the final conclusion, is there a sense of consistency throughout the paper? Are there other conclusions possible that have not been uh, mentioned in the conclusion? Do you think that the research uh, might be uh, extended in future works in directions that have been uh, omitted by the author or the authors? So these were just a few thoughts about what it takes to be or to become an excellent uh, reviewer for the Journal of British Blockchain Association, remember you have been invited, you have been selected to be a reviewer. It's not about your skills, which have been uh, ascertained, so uh, don't worry about that. It's about contributing to new knowledge, striving for excellence. Uh, excellence is a destination and at the same time it's a journey and you are embarking on this journey with us and uh, we are uh, delighted to have you uh, among us. Thank you very much for your time and attention and thank you again to the Journal of British Blockchain Association for uh Okay, so that was uh... That was an excellent talk from Mark. And I just want to make one comment. I think he touched on it very briefly about um, directions of, uh, for future research. I think what's important to, to understand is that you may have a, an experiment uh, that has uh, found to be inconclusive. So you might think that these are negative results in a way that what you wanted to prove has not been proven. So it has not, so the result has shown that the intervention made little to no difference. And the tendency is, and, and sometimes it's, unfortunately there are some outlets that actually only welcome and accept results that are positive, uh, but, uh, not the case with the JBBA. So if you have conducted an experiment uh, which has found to be uh, inconclusive, so you use blockchain and it is an inconclusive result, uh, what sometimes you call negative result, please do submit it to the journal and please do try and publish your findings. The reason it's very important is because if you don't do that, then somebody will waste uh, uh, resources, time, and money to conduct the same experiment. And it will keep on happening again and again and again until the, the whole community uh, has spent significant amount of resources and time to, to keep asking the same question, which uh, they would not have conducted had they, uh, the results been published uh, before. So 
So very, very important that we are uh, a new scientific discipline. And as we try and establish this body of evidence, there are going to be uh, some studies that uh, will be negative studies, uh, but they are equally important, I think, in my opinion, uh, and we do need them. We do need them in, in blockchain. So any questions um, before we conclude our session? So Mark's talk was more about if you are kind of beyond uh, past that early career researcher stage. This is when you are invited to uh, review a paper. Um, okay, I think if there are no more questions, we can conclude our session. And thank you very much for joining in. And uh, thank you to Peer Review Week uh, for uh, inviting us to host this uh, webinar. And I wish you all the best. If you have any questions, you can get in touch with the journal uh, via email. Uh, thank you all. Thank you. Bye-bye.